Good afternoon. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here today uh, to talk to you about uh, aviation innovation. And uh, I got to listen to Miguel and uh, Greg speak earlier today. And, and Miguel, I thought it was a fascinating uh, talk, especially when you think about what we're doing about going to Mars and the discussions about that today. And so I thought it was so timely. And then Greg, I was actually, I don't know where Greg went, but I was actually back at Cincinnati about two months ago uh, with a group from Boeing looking at the additive manufacturing. And, uh, and it is really uh, a real opportunity about where manufacturing is going, going forward. And I think we are really at the cutting edge there. Now, just to give Boeing a little credit here, I do think that we do some additive manufacturing when we wrap our composite fuselages, because really that is additive manufacturing. So, <laughs> but anyways, um, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about innovation, our market space, and some of the challenges I see going forward. Uh, I'll try to leave some time at the end for uh, questions and try to keep us on time. Beth, to get you back on schedule. <laughs> okay. Um, so Boeing's been around for 100 years. We celebrated our 100th anniversary last year. And uh, you know it's really fascinating to think about where innovation has taken us through those 100 years. From Bill Boeing, who out on Lake Union created the B&W to really start transporting uh, air mail, uh, to evolve through the, the war years uh, and early years of jet transportation and uh, in going to lunar missions. And that's where I was a little kid growing up, and I used to go out to the airports, and I'd watch airplanes take off and land. And that's really where I first got enthused about aviation and understanding it. Back then, it was a 727, uh, was cutting edge technology at the time. And, uh, but that, that gripped at my heart. Today, when we look at our innovation, we, we've gone way beyond the 727. And uh, today, we connect the world and bring people together in more ways than could ever be uh, imagined. I mean, years ago, you know, many people had never even traveled on an airplane. In fact, today, there's still a high percentage of the world's population has never traveled on an airplane. But we look at places like China, which is an exploding market for aviation, is really where our uh, biggest growth area is. One third of every 737 we deliver out of Renton goes to China. And so China is a really important market for us. And it's about 20% of our total market overall. But also on our defense and space side, you know, protecting our country, protecting democracy. And then when I think about, you know, we, we take the use of our iPhones today for granted. That we touch an app and we pull up somebody, our friend on there that's down in South America, and we take it for granted that we can connect with them in five seconds. And yet, we forget about you know, all the technology that went into actually creating the iPhone, creating the app, creating the satellite that it communicates with, creating the rocket systems that launch that satellite up there. All in a myriad of seconds when we touch an app and we see our friend half a world away. Technology is incredible where it's taken us and it's connecting our world in more ways than ever before. So our market, I'll just talk a little bit about this, is over the next 20 years, we expect that there's a market out there of almost 40,000 airplanes. Now, Boeing would love to get half of that. <laughs> but but um, you know, there, there, are, there are more competitors out there as well. So Airbus is our biggest competitor, and we compete pretty much head to head with them. Uh, in the market space. It's really interesting to think about the two philosophies that I think really separate Airbus from Boeing. One is our flight deck philosophy of where we put the pilot in the loop in controlling the airplane. The second is our strategy on point to point. Boeing launched on a point to point strategy actually about 10, 15 years ago when Alan Mulally was our CEO. And Airbus really focused on connecting big hubs, London, Singapore, they went with the A380, and we went with the 787. Now, the big thing about aviation is sometimes you don't know your strategy is really going to play out correctly for 20 years. And so now it's interesting to see 10 years ago, Airbus would put ads up about flying over the Atlantic was safer with four engines, and they would show an A340. 
and they were really trying to attack our 777 airplane, which was two engines. But now today, the A340 is basically out of business because everybody has accepted that the, the reliability of the engines is so good that two engines makes a lot of sense and a lot of uh, good economics. On, in our market space, uh, you can see the big growth there is in the single aisle market. So think of a 737 or an A320. And again, as I mentioned, China is, is the big growth area. India is still growing a lot too. There's a lot of opportunity there. And then there's other parts of the world that we still see a lot of growth opportunity. Of that uh, 40,000 airplanes, roughly 60% of that is growth. And about the other 40% is replacement market. So uh, replacing older airplanes that are less fuel efficient and uh, putting in new airplanes. The regional airplanes, you can think of that as your Embraer's or your um, Bombardier airplanes. Um, the small wide bodies would be like a 787. The medium wide bodies would be like a 777. And the large wide body market is what we think of the 747 and the A380. Um, now, there are new entrants that are coming into our marketplace, um, certainly Bombardier. Um, and Embraer people are aware of those companies, but China is developing their own aviation system. Uh, they, they're designing, uh, designing an airplane called the C919, which is supposed to be flying anytime soon. Um, I've been over there, I had a chance to actually look at some mock-ups of that airplane, and um, it may not be the most efficient airplane when it gets it flying, but the, for the Chinese, this is a national uh, priority for them and they will learn and they will redevelop. And for us, it's about uh, helping them understand aviation. We're helping them how to certify airplanes, but we gotta always stay one step ahead of them so that airplanes are always more fuel efficient. The Russians are developing aviation, uh, more airplanes again, uh, the Japanese as well. So there's a lot of new entrants and uh, aviation is a lifeblood of a lot of economies. It grows economies, it's good paying jobs, and so there's a lot of good reasons why many of the developing countries want to uh, go into aviation. Now, our customers, it used to be you could put technology on an airplane, put new features on an airplane, and you could sell the airplane for more money. That was the way we kind of lived life for many, many years. And, but that has changed. Our customers today expect more for less. And the, the pricing pressure that we now see in the marketplace has gotten even tighter. Um, Airbus competes at a very uh, aggressively, and especially in the single aisle market, to win those critical orders. Because sometimes when you put place an airplane at an airline, a startup airline, you can bet on somebody who's a startup airline, you may not get another chance to go back and talk to them for 20 years. And so you really have to place your bets well. And you know, we, we bet on Southwest Airlines years ago when they were just a startup airline out of Texas flying within Texas. And we keep looking for who, who else are those startups like that. And we go after them as we can because we know that's where some of the growth is going to be going forward. Who would have thought that Ryanair, an airline over in Ireland, has revolutionized what we call the low uh, cost carrier market and uh, has uh, taken delivery of well over um, hundreds of airplanes from Boeing. So technology, we're gonna continue to look at technology, but it's really gotta prove itself onto the airplane. Where does it really create value? Where can we sell that value to the airlines or get some value out of it? Where can it take cost out of the production system? And where does it enable a service to help the airlines fly more efficiently? So, I haven't heard people talk about data yet, and I was surprised Greg didn't talk about data as a GE guy. But, oh, there you are. <laughs> but data, and, and so my new boss, Kevin McAllister, just came from GE, so <laughs> he's a big data guy, right? But data is, a, is, is really a, a useful tool to understand how your product is working, how it can be used more efficiently, and how you can improve it going forward. And I think that's something we've got to leverage going further forward. Now, with the, the market growing, because we are a growing market, we are having to raise our production rates. Today, we build 42 airplanes, the 737s, every month. 
And that equates to about every day, two airplanes roll out of the factory. We are uh, planning to go up in rate to 47 and then even higher than that. And we're studying even going as high as 60 airplanes a month. Now, that's almost three airplanes every day rolling out of the factory to support that growing market. Similarly, the 787, which we're almost getting ready to deliver the 600th airplane, the 787, into the market. We deliver right now 12 airplanes a month, but we're studying even going up to 14 airplanes a month on that, which is an unprecedented level for a uh, wide-body airplane. But we're really moving in the production system from being what I would call craft builders to more mass production. Because when you're building 14 airplanes a month versus 42 airplanes a month, it allows you to do different things. And so as we look to become better at our production system, technology has to play a key role there. So we're looking at how automation really can help improve things. We've introduced a lot of automation in some of our uh, wing builds, where our, we build spars, where we build stringers, where we put together panels, and also where we put together our fuselages. Why? Because everybody needs to go home safely at the end of the day. And if you went into our factories 10, 15 years ago, you'd hear a lot of riveting. You'd hear a lot of people riveting into the, the airplane. And you know what? There's a lot of people who worked hard on airplanes that got hurt from doing that. And so part of this is really looking at how do you eliminate some of those injuries from people that are building those airplanes um, from and, and you can, using automation and technology to do that. So we, if you've ever been on the tour in Everett, I would, if you haven't gone recently, go again. We have what we call a fuselage upright build tool now building 777s. We're getting that up to speed. And we're looking at also how to now automate our wing buildup as we get ready for our 777X airplane, which will be a composite wing. And there we're going to be building a 100-foot long stringer. It'll be the longest stringer uh, composite material that's ever been built. And uh, we're making prototypes of that right now up in Everett. So I talked a little bit about increased uh, uh, use of automation, but just a little bit about safety as well. You know, aviation is, we've made incredible strides in, in safety. And you're more likely to die in your bathtub than to be involved in an, in an airplane accident. So think about that for a second. <laughs> but yet we take it for granted. We take it for granted when we walk into the airplane that we're going to get to our destination safely. And you know that's a foundation of trust that we all have in the industry. But as I said, you know, why aren't we applying those same principles to the workers who are building the products? And, and so we've really taken a renewed interest in understanding what's driving injuries in the workplace how do, we, how do we address those from a design standpoint? How do we address them from an automation standpoint? And how do you uh, help the workforce transition as well? Automation, though, is also going to play a big part in our flight decks. I talked about 40,000 new airplanes over the next 20 years. If you figure about 8 to 10 crew per airplane, 16 to 20 pilots per airplane, you can do them. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. You can do the math. And the question is, where will all those pilots come from? Where will the airlines be able to get the people that want to fly the airplanes and train them and get them out flying? And so automation starts coming into the conversation about why not in the flight deck? We have companies out there now testing driverless cars, driverless trucks. The technology exists today to have a driverless airplane. Today's airplanes are capable of doing everything but taking off. The pilot still has to physically rotate the column or pull back on the stick to, to take off. After that, they can engage the autopilot and it flies the des destination safely. But the technology is there to even do the rotation now. But you think about the sensors, you think about all the different uh, automation that would have to go in if you actually took that next step. 
Another thing you have to think about with automation of the flight deck is cyber. And so it's interesting today as we look in, you know, what's going on inside Washington, D.C., uh, there's a lot of talk about cyber and cyber attacks. And the way we today deal with cyber is we, we basically um, create a, uh, a firewall that prevents communication from the ground from ever getting into the navigation uh, without pilot interaction. But if now you start going to automation, you now have to think about how does cyber play into that and, what, and how do you have to go to not just machine learning, but uh, beyond that, where the cyber uh, attacks can be mitigated before they do any harm to the airplane. But it, it's possible. And we may one day see where you walk into the flight deck, where you turn, and you may only see one pilot or potentially no pilots, and somebody on the ground controlling 10 airplanes at the same time. So automation is going to play a really key role, I think, as we get, think about aerospace. Now, you also have to think from a societal and, and uh, um, how, that, how people will feel. How will it affect your safety record? How will you ensure that safety doesn't degrade at all? What will people believe when they get into an airplane and there's not anybody in the flight deck? It's a leap of faith. So um, I'm not saying we're going to eliminate pilots tomorrow, but but that's where some of the technology may lead you to, to go if, uh, if you have the growth that, you, that we expect. Now, the other piece of it is we have to think about what's else, what else is happening in our, in our airspace. So UAVs, um, drones, whatever we want to call them, are now proliferating in people's backyards and, and right now you know, basically below 500 feet. But we know as Amazon and other companies want to do deliveries and um, how do you integrate those things into the airspace so they don't do any harm to airplanes? And um, you know, what, what happens when the first drone hits an airplane? So you know, we have to really be thinking through that today uh, before any of that happens. Um, the 787 uh, was our last uh, development airplane that really took a lot of technologies and integrated them together to really create a new market for us. And it, you know, using composite structure for the first time in, the, in commercial airplanes, um, that, that's really showing that it's very beneficial. The airlines are really also understanding the fuel efficiency and how this airplane opens up a lot more markets. Markets like Austin to London that would never have been flown before are now being flown. And so um, the more electric systems architecture, we think that's going to be a continuing trend as, as we look at how do you further have an all-electric propulsion system on the airplane. And uh, you know, just a point about our point-to-point -point strategy, you know, it wasn't too long ago where it would take you days to fly from Sydney to London, and now it can be done in, in a matter of hours, and that's all from the advancement that technology has brought into the airplanes and the reliability that the engines provide as well. Now, as we look at our market space, um, it's really an exciting time for us from our product strategy. So our, while our production rates are going up, we've got a number of development programs going on. Of course, the US Air Force tanker is, is front and center on us. Uh, we hope to have that certified and delivering the first of those by the end of the year. You know, it's really interesting when you start putting in big fuel systems and big uh, rods sticking out of the airplane to refuel other airplanes flying in close formation. A um, little different than how you had designed the 767 in the first place. But uh, that's, it's coming together well. The 737 MAX, so the first derivative of that we just certified. And so we'll start delivery of those uh, in the upcoming months here. We're, we're actually flight testing the second derivative of the MAX, the Dash 9, which is a little bit longer airplane. And then we'll go to the MAX 7, which is the shortest version of the family. And then we got two other derivatives, we're, one we've committed to and one we haven't yet committed to. One called the 8-200, which is a MAX 8 with an extra door that allows people like Ryanair to put up to 200 passengers on that airplane. So 
Like for them, it's about payload. It's about how many passengers can you fit in the airplane. And it might be tight seats, but if you ever look at a Ryanair, they charge $6 a flight sometimes. So sometimes for that price, people don't care. But, um, but they, they have bought a number of those airplanes. And then we're, we're looking at what's called the MAX 10. We haven't committed to that yet, but that's a further stretched airplane, but it's, it's bringing in some interesting things. While you can easily put a little bit more metal around the airplane to stretch it, we now have to look at the landing gear because of, of the angles of rotation. And so we're now having to actually design a new type of landing gear to go on that airplane, but still fit within the envelope of the existing landing gear. And so we've got a design that we're working through, we're doing some testing of. Um, we hope to be able to launch that later this year. On the 777 airplane, it's been a great selling airplane. We're developing now the next generation of that with a new composite wing, new engines, and uh, the, t the engineering team right now is, is full bore. This is the big year for them where they're doing all the release activity. And uh, that airplane will uh, deliver in 2019. Um, and then we, we have uh, the latest derivative of the 787. The first flight of the 787-10 just flew last Friday out of Charleston. And so it was really exciting to, to have, see that airplane take flight. And uh, that'll be entering the flight test inventory up here in, in the Puget Sound in the uh, coming weeks here. And uh, we'll be proving that airplane out. So it takes us to really looking at the market space of where we're at. So this is what we call our typical payload range curve, uh, which, you know, payload, if you think about seats on the airplane on the vertical axis and range in nautical miles along the vertical axis. Starting in the lower left, you can see that's where really the single aisle market. If you think about a 737, it's a great transcontinental airplane flying New York to London, or excuse me, New York to Los Angeles. Um, and, and, and ranges of about 3,500 3, nautical miles. And depending on how many seats you want, you can get different, uh, but it's basically, that's the heart of the market is really flying that Transcon. Um, at the top end, the 777-300ER is our, and the 777-200ER up there are really the long range airplanes that can fly long distances with about you know, three to 400 passengers. Um, the 787, you, you can see on there, that is really our, our uh, small wide body airplane that really allows you to fly some longer distances with smaller number of seats. That now allows you to start connecting smaller city pairs than what you would have done with a 777 airplane or a 747 airplane. Now, we have the 767-200 showing up there. Um, and the 767-300 and 400 in the lower end of that market. Um, the only people really taking those airplanes today is, is FedEx from a, uh, a cargo market standpoint. Um, and so it really starts op looking at what's really in the middle, what we call the middle of the market. And so one of my previous jobs at Boeing, I was, I was telling you earlier, <clears throat> is I was the last chief engineer of the 757 program. And I got the unenviable task of having to shut down that program. Now, a lot of people love it to be on the startup of a new program, but I'll tell you, you learn so much when you're having to shut a program down that I never uh, regretted that, that opportunity. So it's, it's fascinating for me that now we've come back and we started looking at that mar piece of the market again. The 757, though, was a very expensive airplane to build. And you know, we at the time, we looked at, do we shut it down and bring it back up? And uh, it didn't make any sense at that time. But at the time, back in 2000, 2001, we were looking at extending the range of the 757, which at that time was about 4,000 nautical miles, to increase it to about 4,500 nautical miles or so that would allow airlines to start flying across the North Atlantic. And Northwest Airlines was the big proponent of it. They wanted to fly Detroit to Milan, uh, Minneapolis to Berlin, cities like that. Now, this is before a lot of the winglet technology that you see on airplanes today. Um, then 9-11 happened, and the 757 customer base at, at that time was filled with U.S. airlines, Continental, Northwest, Delta, American Airlines, and basically overnight they started canceling their orders and we ended up scrapping that whole uh, design effort. But now as we start re-looking at that market and start having conversations with customers, we recognize that there is probably a pretty good market there for people that want to do exactly that, 
start connecting those small city pairs that are about you know four to five thousand nautical miles apart with a, pa a payload or a, a seat capacity somewhere in that two to three hundred market so smaller than 787 to make it economical for them to fly those routes and so um, so we're studying that quite significantly um, but the what we also have to recognize is the price point that the airlines are willing to pay for that airplane. And we've got a pretty good idea. So now it's how do you produce an airplane at the price point that will support uh, the price that the airlines want to pay. And, that, and that's a, a challenging uh, uh, effort that we've got going on. And, and that's where technology is really going to take a look at where are we spending resources on building an airplane today? How do we uh, how, many, how much hours and time does it take to build an airplane? How do you shorten that? How do you um, get some of that cost out so that you can produce that airplane and go after that piece of the market? So stay tuned on that. More to come. Now, from a challenging standpoint, um, I would say one of the biggest things is the design cycle. You know, as you look at how, how long our design, how long it takes to design. It, it's taken longer and longer and longer, and we need to figure out how to, to break that cycle and do it in a shorter time. Certification is another thing. Now, I, in my pre, one of my previous roles at Boeing, I was in charge of all regulatory affairs, and I used to go back to Washington quite a bit and talk about the FAA is a key partner of Boeing, but they have limited resources, and we know the government's gonna, not going to fund them anymore, so they're not going to get any more people. So we've got to reprioritize what they're working on and get them working on their newer technology and get them out of doing things that everybody knows how to certify. So things like additive manufacturing. It's great that we got parts like that, but we haven't completely figured out how to certify all those parts fully yet. Now, we are going to deliver a, seven, uh, a galley fitting out of titanium on the 787 in a couple months here. It'll be the first part that we deliver uh, that's made with the additive titanium uh, wire. And uh, so we're starting to work our way through that, but that's going to be kind of one of the holdbacks to really make an additive work from a, an aviation standpoint. Safety is always got to be there. We can't compromise that. Cost, the cost of production, the cost of design are continue. We have to look at how we break the, those curves. And then production and ramp up. So as we introduce ne new technology, how do we make sure that it's hardened properly so that we can start building and ramping up the production much quicker than what we've had been able to do in the past? We typically have struggled introducing new technology until we figure it out and then start going. Part of it is, is when we designed airplanes in the past, what was we designed them for um, basically machining, casting, things like that. And when you design for additive, it's a different thought process, as Greg was talking about. As you design for automation, it's a different thought process. And so having to retrain our engineers about how to go do that is really key. Resources will continue to be um, a big uh, constraint as well. So today, uh, we actually compete for resources with Amazons and the Googles and Facebooks. And uh, it's, it's no longer where uh, engineers just maybe work for Boeing or Lockheed, but we see actually people crossing over between different industries more and more. I think with STEM activities, we've made a lot of progress in, in trying to get the pipeline full, but we still have constraints at universities in terms of the number of people that want to get into engineering and getting that through. I'll, I will tell you, though, that the engineers that we are hiring today are some of the brightest, best engineers that I've met. And so our, I know our future is bright there. Um, so I'll just close by just saying, you know, we've made a lot of progress in aviation. A A aerospace has really been one of the leaders in, in making our societies move forward. And we can still be that leading force in, in driving improvement society, but we need to be willing to take the big steps forward to take on that next big trip, whether it's to Mars, using additive, using automation. We have to be bold in that. And we have to allow our kids and the next generation to keep dreaming of what's possible. So thank you for that. And <clears throat>